you couldn't tell. Uh, so I will talk about analyzing the reference system that Evan introduced. So uh, I will first talk about uh, tracing as a way to extract information. Then I will introduce the raster tracing as a tool to do that for Rust 2. Then I will talk about uh, tracing the reference system in general, what kind of information we can extract. And then I will end with uh, analyzing the reference system itself. So the goal with tracing is to gather real-time execution information. So this is usually low-level information, so it's lower than usual logs and other kind of uh, information gathering tools. So it's useful when uh, issues are hard to reproduce. Usually you can uh, get information like, um, uh, you can get information from the Linux kernel, uh, you can, and then you can also uh, instrument your own applications to get to extract any kind of information from your own application. So to do that, the, the most uh, simple way is to add the, what we call static instrumentation. So you just add code into your application. So you start with instrumenting your application with trace points. Then you compile it, you configure the tracer, you just run your application. And when those trace points and your code are, are executed or hit, those generate a trace event. And each trace event is a piece of information. And those trace events make up a trace. And then you can analyze the trace later on. So as I mentioned, there's uh, different kinds of information we, that we, we, can, we can gather. So from a uh, user space application, and we can also gather information from the Linux kernel. So this kind of approach with the tools that I'm using that, that we are going to be using it uh, Linux only. There's also another approach that you can use. You can uh, create your uh, kind of, um, uh, you can uh, kind of uh, some shims uh, that are that you instrument and then you can LD build them instead of instrumenting your application itself. So you create uh, like kind of a copy uh, library and then you LD preload it with the trace point. And that library can call the real function afterwards. It's kind of a different approach. And then the, there's also the, the dynamic instrumentation, but we don't, I'm not gonna talk about that uh, for, for here. So let's talk about uh, Rust tracing itself. So it's a tool uh, that's closely integrated, integrated into Rust2 since about two years now. So it contains two different things. It has tools to instrument the core of Rust2 with LDTNG, which is a tracer. So it instruments RCSTTT, RCL, ARMW, and currently with uh, ARMW second uh, DS. It also has tools to configure tracing with LDTNG through a command, so rust to trace and through a, a rust to launch action, which is called trace. So those allow us, allow us or you to configure tracing uh, easily uh, since we all know that sometimes you, your, your system is quite complex. You need to uh, really use the, the orchestration system, which is launch in this case. So I would just, uh, so yeah, you launch your application, then which is everything is instrumented, and generate events from LTTNG, and then this gets you a trace, and then you analyze the trace like on. So the kind of instrumentation in those uh, stacks and the layers of uh, Rust2, it's uh, so it gives you it gives you information about the nodes, the publisher, the subscription, the timers, and uh, you can also get information about the callback execution for the subscription and timers and so on. You can also get information about like the message publication, etc. So we'll talk about, um, so this is, I mean, a simple example. Here is just a plot of uh, callback durations for subscription and timers for the reference system. So you can see a bunch of uh, topics and uh, for subscription and nodes for timers. Here. So it's just uh, durations over time. So it's really a simple example, but it's just to show you that uh, we can just get this from the trace and then just plot it and view it easily. So let's talk about what kind of information we can gather and uh, analyze and compute. So there's a lot we can do currently, but there's even more we could do with more work and uh, more. Uh, 
instrumentation, tracing work, and more analysis work. So we can currently, uh, as I said, uh, get information about callback durations for time as substitution. We can then compute a frequency and jitter for those and for publications. So every time uh, published, it's called for a specific topic. We can also get uh, information about uh, the internal behavior of an indicator. So this is, of course, particularly specific. So that, uh, this, is, this would be useful for all the executors that people are going to mention later on, but it's not implemented for, uh, for all of them currently. So the other kind of uh, uh, metrics we, we could compute with more words. So I have a few examples here. So time be between message arrival and callback execution, which is a, an important metric, I think. It's also time between subscription, timer, service readiness, readiness execution, which is similar, but for uh, the objects themselves. It's also, we could uh, get information about the message queue size over time from the, the DDS or other middleware. There's also, uh, we could compute the latency of a specific path in a processing pipeline and so on. There's a lot more we could do. These are just uh, simple examples. So now let's talk about analyzing the reference system that Evan uh, showed. So here are the uh, APIs again. So uh, we can start with CPU usage and memory usage. For those, we are simply going to use a simple PS record tool. So this uses uh, samples to compute simple CPU and memory usage. Then for the latency, uh, we are using a timestamp collected in nodes along the path. So same thing for uh, drop samples. And using those, we can compute latency and the number of drop samples. And then for the jitter of the second behavior planner callback, we can use uh, the callback as far as timestamp from the tree data to compute some uh, jitter. So let's look at the results. So first for the CPU usage, we have the on the left, the multi-threaded executor. On the, in the middle, the single-threaded executor. And on the right, the static single-threaded executor. So these are going to be compared for the next few slides. So for the CPU usage, uh, of course, it's, it's uh, quite straightforward. The, the single-threaded executor mostly use uh, one CPU, and the multi-threaded executor uses more than one CPU. So the CPU usage is uh, different, but this is expected. Uh, for memory now, uh, so the single-threaded executors use less memory. This is again expected because uh, probably the multi-threaded has to use uh, more uh, objects and structures for uh, uh, safety, so it has a higher memory usage. Now for latency, we can see that uh, quite clearly the multi-threaded executor has the lowest latency because probably it can process more data. So it's less uh, quite busy, I guess. And what's interesting here is that this static single threaded executor has the lowest, uh, lower mean and uh, maybe a bigger standard deviation, but it reaches uh, reaches lower latency values than the uh, single threaded executor. This might be because um, it uh, can process uh, objects in different orders, it might not uh, process the timer uh, first before everything else. So now if you look at uh, the drop sample, again, uh, the multi-threaded executor has no drop sample uh, at all. So it's because, again, probably it can uh, process everything correctly with enough uh, processing power. Now for the jitter, the multi-threaded executor, again, is uh, quite clearly the best one. It's uh, hitting pretty much uh, its uh, 100 millisecond period uh, pretty well. And the other ones are uh, not so good. So yeah, so here, uh, however, we can see that the static single-threaded executor is uh, worse than the single-threaded one, than the static one. So these are uh, this. This is a summary of the results. So these are pretty much expected. So the real results will come later on with the ex other executor. So if you want to learn more about uh, tracing and raster tracing uh, for Rust2, 
Uh, you can watch my talk tomorrow uh, to learn more about that. You can also check the repo, or you can also check a simple tutorial on the real-time working group documentation. So you can contact me and check out uh, my GitHub page. So thank you. Any questions? Thanks, Christoph. Um, so that's a question. What will be the output look like from tracing? Will that be Rust pack containing all the running information? Yeah, so uh, tra traces are binary data. So it's, uh, you can uh, view them with uh, simple tools, but, but it doesn't look like a bag. It's similar as in it's a data container, but it's, it's not that you, you don't have images and everything like that. So if you, I will talk about more in, in detail tomorrow in my talk, so I invite you to watch it. All right, and there's a, another question. Is there a significant application runtime performance hit when Rust2 tracing is enabled? So yes, it's, uh, there is one, but it's, uh, it's minimal, and I will talk about it uh, tomorrow. So I tried to, because uh, I, I know it's a concern, and uh, the goal with this is to be able to use it in production as much as possible. So I, I will try uh, to uh, talk about overhead tomorrow. 